Welcome to Lacrosse Classified on the LAX All-Stars Podcast Network. Your home for the latest news from the National Lacrosse League and Indoor Lacrosse. Now, let's talk some lacrosse with your hosts, Jake Elliott and Evan Schemenauer. I liked it so much last week, decided to keep it for another week here on Lacrosse Classified. Old school intro for episode number 40, 48, Evan Schemenauer. Right here on the Lacrosse All-Stars Podcast Network, growing the game one podcast at a time is what we do, and we got a great show here for you today. Thanks for joining us once again on a Tuesday afternoon. Uh, we're going to get into our – we're going to stampede tack season previews here is what we're going to go with, Evan Schemenauer, and we're just going to go right down the line, alphabetical order. We're going to start with the Buffalo Bandits and the Calgary Roughnecks because those are the two – first teams and just work our way right down the line over the next several weeks here talk to a personnel from each of those teams we'll give our kind of synopsis of what we expect uh, to happen in the upcoming season for these teams Evan recap the moves that were made players gained players lost players in limbo injured you name it Um, so let's let's get in this welcome back to the podcast Evan how's things going oh down in sunny Vegas uh Weather's phenomenal. Well, it's not going to be that way in a couple of days, but hoping to hit the Golden Knights game tomorrow night. Okay, and who are they playing? Boston. Oh, well, they, they, they have three games while I'm down here, but the second one's against Calgary, so it might be a little difficult to get tickets, I'm pretty sure. Thanksgiving weekend, Calgary in town. A lot of people flying in for that one. Sure, sure. Um, how long have you been down there for? How long are you staying down there for? I uh, just got here yesterday, well, Sunday night. And, uh, okay. So this is Monday. We're on Monday, just say no. So Evan's going Sunday night, and, and when are you coming back? Uh, next week, Tuesday. Oh, so you're down there for a while. You're down there for a while. You got the whole Which family be with you? but no, nope, just me. Just so long. <laughs> Just, just me. Yeah, Look, I got a pass on this one. Look so. out, Sin City. Evan Schemenauer is on the loose in <laughs> Vegas. Uh, look, I actually saw you. You post up a picture of of your of your spot down there. That's a pretty nice spot. I got to get down there. We got to get down there and and have some fun in Vegas, man. I got to do it. Well, if there is a game in Vegas, like we suspect there will be later in the year, mm. that's the time to fly down, right? Yeah. No, uh, wait, still waiting for an announcement on that. So uh, we'll we'll kind of hold our breath there. It's dismal, rainy, cold here, just so you know, Evan, in British Columbia. So you're not missing okay, anything. It's, so it's, it's a standard day in BC. Yes, it's, it's, every it's day, typical right? Vancouver weather for an <laughs> October afternoon here today. But uh, feeling pretty good. Well, I'm, I'm kind of up and down a little bit. I got a little bit of case of the Mondays, but... Over the past uh, seven days or so, I've managed to shed off a, another five pounds. Evan, 85 is the total now, so feeling pretty good about that. Yeah, no, I mean, in Las Vegas, I think i got to change my settings on my Fitbit because that 5,000 daily step goal, I'll, I'll meet that by about you know 6 p.m. <laughs> the amount of walking you have to do in the city is crazy. Yeah, not a lot of hills, though, right? In Vegas, not a lot of hills in Vegas. No, but the thing is, is that you look and you say, oh, that, ca- that casino is just right next door, and it's going to take you 25 minutes to get there. Yeah. <laughs> That's the deceiving well, if you part walked, of Vegas. If you walked from, like, where you live in Vegas, could you walk to the Strip from where you live? No. I mean, to, just to get to the north end of the Strip is about a 15-minute drive. Okay. All right. Well, enough about Vegas for now, Evan. We will talk about that again, but we need to get into our Stampede Tack season previews, Evan. And uh, we're probably going to get some new wording for this, but let's go with the old stuff for this week until uh, we can talk to Kevin and, and get something arranged. They carry a wide range of hats to keep you protected from the sun, like in Vegas, or the rain, like here in Vancouver, or the snow, maybe in Saskatoon. Camping, fishing, hiking, anything you do outdoors, Stampede Tax got a hat for you. Visit them online at stampede.ca, where shopping online is still shopping local, or pop down there to Cloverdale and, and check out their selection. Yeah, and actually, Kevin just posted that they apparently now have the winter Blundstones in stock oh, now. Oh, baby. 
All right. Well, there you go. There's reason enough. Uh, it's a that was actually hilarious. Was that? Yeah. My my mom swore like when I posted it on on social media saying I went and got blundstones. <laughs> she thought they were traditional cowboy boots. She thought I'd gone mad. Oh man. <laughs> but, yeah. You know they're they're actually very very nice. You know work boot type. No, they're awesome. They're absolutely spectacular, and uh, Kevin will hook you up, man. He's got a wide range of boots down there at Stampede Tack as well. All right, Evan. Um, season previous, let's start with the Buffalo Bandits here. We're going to talk to Chugger. We're going to talk to Steve Dietrich, the GM of the Buffalo Bandits, coming up here in about 10 minutes' time. He's actually down in Disneyland right now uh, on vacation with the family at the happiest place on earth right now. So he's uh, he's going to take a little time out of his vacation to talk to us here on Lax Class, which we appreciate. But let's talk about the Buffalo Bandits before we talk to Steve Dietrich. And I don't know, where do you want to begin with this? I get, let, Maybe we start with, with what the Bandits have lost. And Thomas Hogarth probably comes to the top of the list. Here's a guy that they protected probably in favor of Sean Evans being a younger guy, maybe a little more versatile, and Hoagie goes down in the World Championships with looked to be a pretty serious knee injury. Hearing MCL, don't have a definitive report on that, but uh, that's a huge loss right out of the gates for the Bandits losing Thomas Hogarth. Well, it's massive, and it just tacks on to the fact that you lost Sean Evans in the expansion draft, you lost Jordan Durston in the expansion draft, and now you just lost a third forward. Now they're going to be a little bit shorthanded. And Chase Fraser sure coming recap- back off an injury too, Evan. Like he he missed the, yeah. almost the entire summer season as well. And you wonder how close to a hundred percent he's going to be going into camp. Well, and you think about it too, is he went down literally two days after the protected rosters were finalized. You know, had that ha- had that happened before the rosters had to get into the league, would they have changed who they protected? That's entirely possible. But, yeah, there's going to be a lot of holes up front. It's going to be interesting to see what happens because Ethan O'Connor also just went under the knife, so they they don't have him. Uh, Zach Higgins, they've traded him now to Philly. They got Doug Buck in back, so they still have a backup, and they also have Devlin Shanahan there as a backup. But it's that, that powerhouse up front that is going to be interesting to see how they fill the holes. Yeah, I mean, uh, Kluche is going to have to take a more prominent role. Uh, we'll see how productive Corey Small is going to be for another year. I th- I still think there's some firepower left. Listen, this team went to the NLL Cup a year ago, so some some key guys gone for sure, but I still think there's enough firepower in that Bandits lineup to, to do some damage. Oh, no question. you got, you got Dean Smith and, you know, that guy on his own is going to get you a ton of goals. Corey Small, I expect him to have a whole bunch of, you know, outside shots still in his bank. Josh Byrne is in great health. There's not going to be an issue there. They're still better off than most other teams. But are they at the level they were last year that got them to the final? Maybe not. Maybe not. I think we might see McKay maybe take some reps up front as well. Um, but I, I th- almost feel like the biggest loss out of that Buffalo lineup may be Jordan Durson, and not maybe from a point production standpoint, but it's all the little things that Dirty does on the lacrosse floor that help team offenses produce. And – not everybody – there's not a lot of guys in the league that can do what Jordan Durston does. You know what I'm saying there? Well, see, what he was doing, Thomas Hogarth took over doing last year, right? Busting it in the middle, getting open, you know, causing defenses to shift. Now you've lost both of them. And now who's that guy that's going to be busting it in the middle? Yeah. No, it's, that's the question, really. That's the question. Uh, they throw the franchise tag on Steve Perello. No real surprise there. I mean, you got to protect them, and you know, I don't know what Steve's mind was in there. Whether he was looking to go somewhere else, or whether he was just looking to get maximum value. But I mean, captain your team, one of the top defenders in the league. Pretty simple decision there. And also, the you know, the other nice thing they got was they got a renegotiated deal with Matt Vince for three years, which helps them with some of their cap issues. Yeah, and I think a real key for Matt Vince, not that. He seemed to be slowing down or can't handle the workload, but I think taking a summer off for Vino is going to, at least the back half of the summer with the, the arrival of his child, I think this is going to 
This is going to be a motivated, rejuvenated Matt Vince. Like, this guy is so good, Evan, that he can literally just win you games on his own. So I think Matt Vince and the Buffalo Bandits, like, he's good for three, maybe four wins just on Matt Vince's performance. And, and like, I, I don't think I'm overselling that. The truth be told, I still have Buffalo ranked number one in their division. I don't think that Toronto's going to give them a challenge, but I still have Buffalo number one. And of course that gets them into the top three seeds. If that happens into the playoffs, gives them a bit of a push down the road. You never know. You might pick up a six coming out from out West having to play you in the opening round. So if they can get through that division, they're going to be in pretty good shape come May. Absolutely. And, and the last thing we probably need to talk about is their draft and and they go after a guy in brett knows where the this is the guy that was the goldie his whole life am i right on this this guy was like the top goalie in ontario his entire career before switching to player i'm honestly not as familiar with him as you are i i think i'm i'm almost sure positive that this was the guy who was like a top flight not only like he was what the best goaltender coming out of ontario through his whole minor, through junior, and then late in his junior career, decided, you know what, I want to try playing out. So he's had very limited experience as a as an out player, but this guy gets snapped up with the 11th pick because he's got that much upside to him. Yeah, and uh, they still have some issues on defense, and if McKay is going to be playing more offense, which wouldn't surprise me either, they're going to need some more help in the back. You know, a, a pretty obvious pick in a in a draft that was very defensive heavy. There wasn't a whole lot of good forwards at eleven that they could have taken and not have downgraded what the best available player was at that point. Yeah, yeah, no question about it. Uh, we're going to talk to Steve Dietrich about all of that that we just talked about right there with the the Buffalo Bandits lineup coming up. We're also going to talk to Kurt Malowski in, in about 25, 30 minutes from now, but let's, let's touch on the Roughnecks here before we get to Chugger, Evan, and nobody really left as far as unsigned goes for the Calgary Roughnecks, which is a lot different than what they experienced going into training camp a year ago. Well, up to a month ago, we did have a major question mark with Dane Dovey, and there were offers flying around at him, and he's decided to stay put and signed a two-year deal, and they got some stability there. But yeah, last year, they went into opening day with no Jesse King because of injury. They had no Curtis Dixon. They had no Westberg the entire year. And guys were just rotating in and out of this offense as quick as they could, just trying to figure out who was going to play that night. Yeah, and and I mean, you could see it at the beginning of the year with them. They are very inconsistent. They had a hard time scoring goals until they kind of found the right mix, the right chemistry. Then they got Dixon back, and, and Dutch was starting to get healthy again. Uh, they had Bushy producing. They, they dealt him away. Tyler Pace is in and out of the lineup. That's something we, we still don't really know a whole lot about is the Tyler Pace situation, Evan. Yeah, he had visa issues in the U.S. that he could not play any road games in the United States. And that's going to cause another problem when two of your four opponents in your division are in the U.S., so there's three games you can't make. And with the remaining teams, it's about another, say, four games or so, three, four games that you can't make. It takes quite a bit out, and especially with... Reese Dutch, well, we hope he's going to be there day one, but we don't know if he will be. Jesse Kane, we'll have to find out what his injury status is. We don't know. He went under surgery for a broken thumb. So there's still some question marks going on. And that, you know, the fact that Pace just can't play in the U.S., if that's still the case, we don't know. Then we'll have to wait and see how this all plays out. Yeah, I mean, they, they lose Riley Lowen to free agency to Vancouver. They lose their captain in Dan McRae uh, in the expansion draft. And, and I mean, that's your captain. <laughs> like, how do you, I don't know, I don't know, I don't think you can replace Dan McRae. I mean, they, they got some leaders there in Calgary for sure, but to lose your captain, that's, that's tough going into a season. Now they're going to have to, to figure out which guy they want to put the C on. It was a tough choice at the end of the day as to what to do there because McCray was an unrestricted free agent, but 
New York picked him knowing that they could franchise him. And I don't believe they used the franchise tag at the end of the day, but they still have the ability to pay him more than what he could have got in Calgary and be closer to home. So that, that kind of played it out that way. But, you know, who's the captain now? Well, who do you think? You know, who do you think's the captain? I mean, I, I think the easy choice would probably one. be I mean, Doby, but how much how much longer does Do- Doby have? Like, do you do you want to switch your captain? Yeah, I know, but I'm saying, like, do you put put the captain on Doby, and then you're going to have to get a new captain in two years from now, or do you maybe pick a younger guy that you know is going to be around for a while and can and and can kind of m- grow into that captaincy? What do you do? See, I would I would give it to Doby now. If if this was say four or five years ago. Would I make Dane Doby the captain? No, you know you got to have somebody that you can rely upon to be there for you know more than just on the floor. But he's cleaned his act up. He's got his head straight. That's the guy I go to at this point in time. Uh, I, I mean, Zach Courier's on my list. Uh, Jesse King's on my list. But King, you don't know how long he's going to be out for. Well, I, don't worry about the injury, though, Evan. We're talking, we're talking the captain here. So, right, you're you're looking at the future. You're looking at now. You're looking at the future. You're looking at five years down the road. Is this guy going to be wearing your C for your franchise for a long time to come? Like, I don't think you're doing this with one year in mind or a short term injury within mind. You're looking at a grand scheme, like a big spectrum of. Who do you want to be the face and the leader of your franchise for the next five years? I think that's how you got to look at this. Well, and this is the other thing that I, I will have to look at with Zach Courier. Like, he, unfortunately, he did not get title six, and we had that wrong last week. Mm. He had five titles already. We forgot the, last the second man months. cup. <laughs> yeah, we forgot about the second man cup. So he was in the MLL final on Sunday, an unfortunate ending, a missed timeout call by the official cost Denver a chance to get the game tied. But, um, no, but hang know. on a second now. I've been asking about this because I didn't have – I was on the road driving. Now, what exactly happened here that has Twitter just absolutely ablaze on this – what 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 happened? It was – they came up with this and they missed the, – the referees missed a timeout call that would have given Denver possession. What happened? Yeah, that, that's basically what it was. I didn't see it either because I was on the plane – from Saskatoon to Calgary at that point in time when, when this was going on. Like people are really heard, mad about this. Yeah, Denver was man down and got possession, tried to call a timeout and didn't get the call. Yeah, and unfortunately then Courier went after the official, got tossed from the game. Um, it is what it is. But still an amazing season. The difficulty is he's now played 60, 65 games yeah. this past year. Yeah, I think Mark Matthews is, is almost right at point this, where it yeah. gets too much. Matthews is right in the same neighborhood as he is too. Like I think Matthews said he was he was uh, over 60 games played this year too. And you think, well, you know, there's 365 days a year, 60 lacrosse games in a calendar year. That is some hard miles on the body. Let me tell you, I I, <laughs> I went out and played a game of Masters lacrosse last night, Evan. I'm still walking funny 24 hours later, and that's one game. And I know it's Masters lacrosse. It's like slower than you know <laughs> you can possibly imagine but I, I just like i can't wrap my head around what it would be like to to put 60 games on your body in a year that's nuts yeah and, and it's it's the more the impact of the box games than it is the field games in the field games you're not getting cross-checked every half a second yeah <laughs> you know you're not you know constantly hitting bodies all over the place you got more space you don't take as big of a toll on on your bumps and bruises in a field game. The Couriers played a lot of box across this past year. No doubt. Um, no doubt. So just to kind of wrap up Calgary here before we wrap up uh, Stampede Tax season previews, uh, they lose Westberg, which isn't, I don't know, it almost doesn't feel like a loss because – he didn't play a single second for the Roughnecks last year. The Iceman now down in sunny San Diego, and they get a first and a second round pick. They get Shane Simpson back from the expansion draft, and uh, they pick up Hayden Dixon and Liam LeClaire in the draft, along with Marshall King as well. So some gaps to fill in offensively. We're going to talk to Kurt Malowski about it all coming up right here on Lacrosse Classified. 
But it's the general manager of the Buffalo Bandits who comes up next. First timer on Lax Class as well. Chugger, Steve Dietrich on the other side. This is Lacrosse Classified on the Lax All Stars Podcast Network. Hey, this is Chris Corville, captain of Team Canada and the Saskatchewan Rush. You're listening to Lacrosse Classified on the Lax All Stars Podcast Network. All right, lacrosse fans, welcome back to Lax Class. Lacrosse Classified here on the Lax All Stars Podcast Network. We now have a first time guest here on Lax Class. I know he's super excited about it because he just told me before we came back on air here. It's the general manager of the Buffalo Bandits, one Steve Chugger Dietrich. Steve, thanks for doing this. Guys, I'm completely honored, and I and like I just said to you, Jumbo, you must not have been able to get anybody else from Buffalo, so I'm glad that uh, I'm glad that I could make myself available. Yeah, Gertler turned us down, Bermel turned us down, uh, we even tried Teddy Cordingly, he was busy, so no, we, we really appreciate that. We like to talk to the men in charge, and that's what you are in Buffalo, and, and training camp is, is right around the corner, man. I know you're you're getting in your vacation now like a lot of lacrosse players do. This is the vacation window for laxers. Uh, you're in the happiest place on earth right now. How's it going down in Disneyland? Yeah, she was nice today. It was supposed to rain most of the day, but the rain held off, and we were at the Magic Kingdom, and we were at, um, I guess, Universal Studios. We did a little bit of both today, so... I'm uh, I'm uh, really uh, ready to rock right now. I'm, I'm glad I'm able to sit down. <laughs> you're, you're looking to get back to some some hot sauce and blue cheese at uh, at the anchor bar there. I I, yeah. I got uh, now. I'm I'm assuming. I, I'm hoping anyway that you maybe have some some young kids along with you, or is this maybe just an excursion for you and, and the missus? No, I do. I have a, an 18 year old daughter, so it's something that we were we used to be able to do every year at this time but then when she got into high school we uh, we shut her down for about four years and now she's graduated so now we thought we'd do it again so oh, fun. Uh, i joke i'm i'm real excited to be here it's it's gonna be a great vacation absolutely absolutely uh i haven't been since i don't know man like i was 10 years old it's probably time for me to get back down there with my young one as well uh let's talk some bandits lacrosse here man and i i don't know where you want to begin chugger but uh i let maybe we'll we'll start with the bad stuff and get to the good stuff if you know what i'm saying and that and, and yeah maybe, sure Maybe we start with Thomas Hogarth uh, going down at the World Championships. Man, like that, that's got to be a tough blow for you going into a season when Hoagie's kind of coming into his prime, and it looked pretty serious. Yeah, it, you know what? It's it's always difficult. And, you, you know, Jumbo, you and I go back a long way, and, and summer lacrosse has always been so important to us. And, and you know, when we grow up, your, your your dreams were to win a Mac Cup. So, you know, now that I'm sitting on this side, it's almost I'm at the point now where I, I hope these guys don't want to play summer lacrosse yeah. anymore because you're just, you know, out of one eye, you're, you're, you're closing one eye and looking, you know, out of the other one, hoping nothing happens. But, yeah, it, um, you know, unfortunately, Hoagie got hurt. Um pretty severely so he'll be out for the year and, and and it hasn't really been a great off season for the bandits you know we lost ethan o'connor uh he's out for the year he tore his knee up in the summertime and then you know of course losing two tremendous players in the expansion draft that we lost in sean evans and jordan durston so it hasn't been a hasn't been a fabulous off season for us that's for sure just through that expansion draft process because there was no way you had an easy decision up front with the, the talent level that you had last year you ought to go younger, keeping Cloutier, keeping Hogarth, letting a veteran like Sean Evans go. Take us through the thought process when you went through all this. Yeah, I mean, it was going to, you know what, we knew we knew we were going to get hurt no matter which way we did that. Um, you know, you, you hit the nail on the head. We opted to go younger. Obviously, with the salary cap and the salary structure, all that stuff obviously plays a role. Um, the number beside a, person, a person's age plays a role. Um, you know, when, when we let Evie go, we thought, okay, we're, we're pretty deep on that side because we'd still have Dane and we'd have Chase. And, you know, obviously at that point we'd have Hoagie. So we thought we'd be okay there on the left side. We thought, okay, we're still going to have Cloutier. We're going to have Byrne and we're going to have Corey Small. We thought we'd be okay there if, 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 um, Dirty got taken. So it was a, it was an incredibly difficult, uh, you know, decision to not, uh, keep both of those guys. But like I said, we were going to get hurt no matter which way we went. And, you know, we opted to try and keep as much youth as possible. Um, 
you know, and, and potentially free up some money, but nothing ever gets freed up because, you know, with the way the salary structure is now, the guy's going for first year and they get the big bump and guys second year get a big bump. So there's there's never really any salary relief, but um, it was a, it was an incredibly tough decision. And and what what's the plan now, Steve? Like, how do you replace those? I don't know if you can replace a Thomas Hogarth and a Jordan Durston, who were such versatile guys for you and, and kind of complemented each other across – the, the floor with doing the dirty work and the little things that maybe go unnoticed by a lot of people, real effective players in, in that department. Is there a plan? Is, is Mackie coming up front? Uh, do you, are you going to try and look for some free agents to try and supplement that or, or maybe give some young guys a chance? Well, you know what? You're right. You, you, the, the, you, you basically mentioned Hoagie and, and Dirty do the things that really go unnoticed. And yeah, Hoagie had a great year last year. I don't, you know, I don't know the numbers, but I think he had close to 30 goals or, or over or just below. Um, but yeah, like they, they're the pick setters. They're the guys that get the second and third possessions on, you know, reshot clocks. So they do all the stuff that doesn't really get noticed on the, on the, you know, the stat sheet, but get noticed by the coaches. So it's tough to do. Um, and, and they're tough to replace. Right. But, you know, we're hoping that uh, Chris Cloutier can have a better year, uh, his second year with us and, and continue to develop. You know, we still have Josh there and we have Corey there. So, you know, we're hoping that those guys, although they're not Jordan Durston, as in, you know, banging bodies and, and getting all the resets himself we're hoping that they can fill that role and yeah we still have the option of, of ian mckay that can transition from the back end and, and stay in, and play offense on the right side you know now we're down two right you lose Avi and, and now you've lost thomas hogarth so um you know we have a guy like dallas bridal who's a banger um somebody that i thought had a great year this summer when he got traded from oakville to brampton yeah um we're hoping that he can come into his own you know we're bringing uh, cam uh cam milligan into camp a uh, guy that had a great year for uh, Coburg, I think he was fifth or sixth in the league in scoring, so we're hoping he can do it. And then there's always the trade route. I don't think there's anything out available in free agent right now, but there's always the way, you know, you can always look to try and acquire somebody um, probably a week or two into camp if, if we don't like what we see. But, you know, they, we're not going to we're not gonna be able to go out and get a Thomas Hogarth or a Sean Evans, um, you know, midway through training camp. So, you know, the guys that we have, you know, the, everybody talks about the next man up philosophy. The guys that we have, you know, they're going to get their opportunity. Like Chase wants to have an opportunity to be one of the big guns. And Dallas wants an opportunity to, you know, to, to play regularly. Well, you guys are going to get your chance. Yeah. Well, I so, mean, talk about Chase Fraser, Chugger, because, I mean, he, he – you more or less – you put him on the protection list and, like, I don't know what it was, Evan, like two days later went down in the summer with an injury. And you talk about guys not – you know, not – there is a prime example. Uh, one of your star players going down in the summer with an injury, and he hasn't played a lot of lacrosse since then, if any. Um, but you're going to rely on this kid to come in and, and make an impact, especially with those two guys no, not there anymore. Yeah, and y- you know what? Um, Chase had a tremendous playoffs for us. Uh, you know, I, I don't like to think back too much of the Calgary series, but, uh, you know, he might have been the best offensive player we had on the floor. So, yeah, um, yeah, yeah right, uh, right after the expansion draft, I hear Chase – Chase hurts his knee, so I, I swallowed hard on that one. But, you know, good news is he should be 100% and ready to go for the beginning of training camp, so that that's good for us. And, yeah, we need we need Chase to continue to develop and continue to take the step forward. And, you know, like he, he's chomping at the bit to get the opportunity, just like I mentioned Dallas. You know, he wants the ball in his stick. He wants to be a go-to guy. Well, he's going to get an opportunity now because there's going to be, you know, lots of opportunity on the right-hand side. A new division this year. Um a lot of teams you've, of course, faced three, two teams you've faced in the past, but now you've got the old Rochester, you've got the new Rochester over in, or old Rochester in Halifax, new Rochester back home. Is the rivalry now going to be twice as good? <laughs> yeah. yeah, you know, the, the, the scary thing is I, I used to, uh, I used to hate going into that building because it, it didn't, you know, it's almost like the Montreal Canadiens and the Toronto Maple Leafs, right? It doesn't matter if one team was good and the other one wasn't or vice versa. It was always going to be a battle. And we, you know, we never seemed to do well in that building. Um, so yeah, we, we still have the the natural grown rivalry with, with that franchise, even though they've moved to Halifax. And of course the new franchise, which, you know, is under the business umbrella, I guess, of Pagula sports. Um, that one's going to be the, the definite natural rivalry we're going to have. And then of course we have the hatred with Toronto that we're always going to have and probably will always, it'll probably always be that way. So let's hope so. Um, let's yeah. hope so. Yeah. 
Yeah, so it, it, our our division is going to be so tough. You know, um, Mike Kersey is doing a great job. Um, he's basically signing every free agent out there in Rocha in Halifax. So they're they're going to be good. they're going to be good. And, and Danny Carey's done a tremendous job. Um, you know, building the the new Rochester team, and you know Jamie and those guys in Toronto have have done a great job with David Brock and and Dan Dawson in Toronto. So uh, our division is going to be tough. I thought going into the off season, I wouldn't want to be a, a Western team because that division is going to be so tough. Well, I don't like my division too too much now either. So <laughs> it's gonna it's gonna be tough. Speaking with Buffalo Bandits general manager Steve Dietrich, uh, I'm I'm pumped to see uh, Blue Cross Arena, and I know they're doing some some upgrades and and some re enhancement around uh, Blue Cross Arena. No more, it's not it's br- uh, the new turf, man. Like it, no more green concrete essentially uh, there for the Nighthawks anymore. Well, and green concrete and and rolls and it's lumpy and <laughs> some of the, yeah, it was like, that. like that stuff was probably 15 years overdue. Am I wrong on that? Yeah. Like, yeah, and then you, when you get to the fact of the, that that it's bad, but then it's it's also I, you know, I think there's guys that have bled and done everything on that thing 15 years ago, <laughs> yeah, and it's still you the might same have been one of them. Right? Yeah, yeah, there you go. So it, it's you know it, it's it, it, that carpet's well overdue, but yeah, I think they're putting a new score clock in. Yeah. I think they're doing more things to the building, so it's going to be exciting. Like I, I, I was there in '95 when you know we still had a stage at one end and then wow. you know they started to change things around then so i've seen that building go through a lot of changes um it's going to be interesting the first time we go in there to see uh, what else they've done no doubt about it uh a couple of more minutes here with steve dietrich uh you, you slap the franchise tag on steve priolo you uh rejig a three-year deal with vino uh maybe walk us through the decision process behind those two guys well we had talked to matt uh a while back on you know chances are you know we'd like to take the tag off him and le- keep our options open uh in case we want to go out and you know acquire somebody or trade for somebody that we might have to franchise or you know might we might just make it real easy and franchise steve so it was something we were working on with matt for a while and and um you know matt was open to it and and uh it worked out well for us and you know we worked hard with steve uh prior to the august 1st date nothing could come to fruition so we you know we obviously had to slap the franchise tag on him and and we're still working through things with him and hopefully we'll get him signed here pretty quickly but um you know they're both real key parts of our team and and you know for matt to step up and you know offer what he did and and stuff like that to try and make the team better just speaks volumes to not only the goaltender he is but the player that he is and and um, you know he always puts the team first so we were happy and, and excited and like I said we'll get Steve signed here so- shortly and, and everything should be good to go. Despite having a whole bunch of issues up front and having to replace guys you go get Brent Noseworthy in the draft uh, number 11. Tell us about this kid what do you think his future holds? You know, it got to the point where there was two kids that, that we really liked at that spot. Um, you know, Brent was one, and, and the other guy I, uh, that we liked, I think, went two spots after after we took Brent. But the, the thing I like about Brent is, you, you know, I, I like size. I like big guys. You can't, you know, you can't teach size. Um, I like the fact that he played attack in college, so he's got a good stick. I like the fact that he played defense uh, in Brooklyn this year. So, you know, because I, I really believe that's where he's going to have to at least start. Um, is out the back door and, and we'll see, you know, a year or two down the line if he can play offense. And I really like his athleticism. So, um, you know, we think the tremendous, there's a tremendous amount of upside there. Um, is especially it, with Steve, the fact is that, this the kid that was a top goaltender in Ontario when he was growing yeah, up? Yeah, he was. A, yeah. And I was just going to mention that he was a team Ontario goaltender up until I think midget. And then he decided to start to play out. So he's only played, I think he might even have taken a couple of years off and then he started to play out. He's only yeah. played yeah. out about four years and, you know, he was an attackman at, at Michigan and then he played regularly for the, that's for the Redmond. So, or, yeah. And w- that's what I'm like, you know, the, I think the kids got a very, very high ceiling and that's why we, we took them and, and, um, you know, we're, we were real excited to get him. And it was a tough choice because I really liked the other kid too. 
Um, and I know he's going to probably have a great future too, but um, we just like the ceiling that uh, knows where he has. Yeah, well, let's. Uh, I gotta. I gotta get a mention from my boy Rob Buck, and uh, who's your Western scout, and he always seems to to manage to get one pick in there, whether it be Chase Fraser. This time around, it was. I'm going to help you out here, Chugger. It's Nathaniel Kineznikov. Okay, Kineznikov. Yeah, I just call him. I call him Con. Yeah, yeah. That's what cool. most. I'm just you know just in case. Uh, but talk about uh, talk about this kid and why you picked him. Uh, how did Buck and sell you on on cause well you know it's hard to draft um premier offensive players um it's past the first round you, you usually will get a real good offensive player if you really want them in the first round taking them past that you're almost throwing a dart at the board and now when our first round seems to last almost 20 picks it gets even <laughs> worse when you get into the second round so um Bucky only five a and a half hours there at the draft yeah, no big deal like, but we were sitting, we were sitting at the draft table, and it, we were like two hours in, and I don't even know if we were midway through the second round yet. And we're like, I, I don't even know if we're going to get out of here. Today. Yeah, like this yeah. is unbelievable. Imagine being in Vancouver and having to wait until the fourth. <laughs> oh, I know, Gilly and <laughs> Gilly and those guys sat right behind us, and we're like, why did you guys? Why did you even come? Yeah, you guys should have You should have showed up about ten o'clock to make your right. pick. Um, but no, B- Bucky was all over the cause, kid. About. Um, he thinks he's a, a premier talent. He thinks he's got a real good shot. Yeah. He thinks he flew a little bit under the radar because of, of the knee. Right. Um, you know, so, so he was the guy that, that we were hoping to, that would be sitting there when he was. And, you know, when he was there, we were pretty happy and, and we jumped all over it. So we were happy to get him and, and, you know, a kid that I really was targeting from probably last year when I watched him was, was Ryder Garnsey mm. and be able to get him in the third round. I was really excited about that as well. Yeah. I checked him out in the PLL a little bit. And I think you did, you did get a steal there and cause a bad chance to watch that kid uh, kind of mature for the last three, four years, uh, announcing Langley games. And he could be a steal for you, Chugger. Hey man, uh, I'll let you get back to Mickey and Snow White and, and Goofy and whoever else you're hanging out with there in, in Disneyland. Appreciate you coming on lax class here and best of luck to your uh, to your bandits in the upcoming season man thanks guys i really appreciate it thanks for having me on our pleasure that was general manager of the buffalo bandits steve dietrich and uh i don't know why we waited so long to do that evan great conversation there and i guess the one nice thing we heard there is that the injury to chase fraser isn't as serious as we had thought it might be okay so if hang on evan, evan, training training. evan chase sorry chase fraser Chase Fraser. Fraser, yes, not not yeah. the TV show, <laughs> the doctor, psychiatrist. Believe me, I had that conversation with Gertler. Yeah, <laughs> I know. He's like just the Fraser, Fraser, and he's like, yeah, he, go with either. It doesn't matter. But no. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Anyways, uh, yeah, good to good to know that that Chaz Fraz is going to be good to go for camp because they're going to need him, uh, especially with with Evie and Hogarth not being in that lineup now. Uh, he's going to have to step his game up and elevate, uh, which I think he's more than prepared to do. I think he's a real big talent and and ready to kind of burst on the scene as upper echelon of right handed scorers in the NLL. Yeah, and they're going to need it because they got a they got holes to fill and. That was the weird thing. It's for a face-off specialist. You're normally the guy that falls out the back door. Mm. This he's a rare kid that the face-off specialist can go straight out the front door. Yeah, you know, he'll he take it right to the floor. rack too, right? If he wins a cleaning. Yep. All right, man. Let's uh, let's get to break. Quarter two done. Quarter three coming up. It's Kurt Malowski from the Calgary Roughnecks next here on Lacrosse Classified on the Lax All Stars Podcast Network. Pure Vita Labs is proud to bring you the highest quality sports supplements on the market. PVL products are 100% all-natural with no artificial flavors, colors, or sweeteners. And the entire line is also Informed Choice certified. We designed all our products with the athlete in mind. We look forward to being a part of your athletic achievements, helping you push the bar higher, win at the highest levels, and set personal records for years to come. Hi, it's Canada. You're listening to Lacrosse Classified on Lax All-Stars. Welcome back to Lacrosse Classified. Quarter number three on deck here. Jake Elliott, Evan Schemenauer. You just heard from our friends right there. Pure Vita Labs. Anything else would be on Sportsman like hashtag flip the switch. Best supplements on the market. Informed choice certified. All natural. Nothing artificial. And uh, the next man we're about to touch. He's got a few players on his team that are sponsored by PVL. Del Bianco, Tyler Pace, Curtis Dixon. All on PVL supplements. I suggest you check them out at PVL.com. 
pvlabs.com or at pure vital labs they're big on the instagram rpvl check them out always posting up good content there recipes you name it uh check them out pvl.com i mentioned he's an nll head coach champion head coach uh, he won one as a player as well just won himself a gold medal with Team Canada. Good friend of mine and of the program. It's Kurt Malowski back on Lacrosse Classified. Kurt, thanks for doing this. Thanks so much, guys. I love being on. We love to have you on, man. You're one of our favorite guys to talk to because you you just you keep it real. You you give us the straight goods, and that's what we like here on Lax Class. So uh, good to have you back. Uh, we're kind of we're starting at the top. Uh, we talked to Chugger before you about uh, the Buffalo Bandits and the season that is to come for them. Of course, you guys met in the NLL Cup not too long ago. Uh, as we move from B to C, Calgary is up first. So. Um, this is kind of our first week of team season previews here. Let's talk about your Calgary Roughnecks. Uh, some changes here, obviously. Why don't we start with with your captain, Kurt Malowski? Uh, no more sexy basement Dan McRae in your lineup. Do you have an idea who you're going to slap the C on for this upcoming season? Uh, we're really going to miss Danny. He did a great job on and off the floor for our, our team and the organization. And uh, we tried to get him back. We just weren't able to uh, match the contract at a real nice one with New York. And, you know, a little closer at home for him, closer to flight. So we're really happy for him. And and uh, for us, as far as the leadership group goes, we got a lot of candidates that we're going to look to look to put the C on. Uh, you know, we got a good group of uh, assistant captains, and we got some good veteran guys there and a good crop of young guys. So uh, we'll talk amongst the coaches, but we, uh, we have a pretty good idea where we want to go. You've got a few big injuries coming out of the summer ball. Reese Dutch, Jesse King. Do we have an update yet as to where these guys are? Do you expect them to be suited up opening day? Yeah, I can give you the update from what I know. Um, Jesse King's had surgery on his thumb, so he'll be. Uh, he's probably going to have to go light the first weekend of camp. We go November first weekend, and then we get a, uh, and then we have a weekend off. And then we go again the following week in an exhibition game. So he should be ready to play in that one is my understanding. And then Dutchie, uh, the injury wasn't as bad as first, you know, anytime you have an Achilles injury, a uh, tear of any sort is, 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 you know, not good. But if there could be the best case and the worst case scenario, it's, it's so to speak, it's, it, it kind of got, kind of got pulled off the bone is my understanding. It didn't get severed. So the uh, rehab time is a lot better. So we're hoping we're, I think we're in Roch around this, 16th somewhere in there in january and that's the target date we're hoping back to get dutchy back so um bad news right out of the gate but not not catastrophic you know we, we went through some injuries last year we'd have jesse all year pretty much so it's uh you know whatever we can get to get him back it'll be good so those two guys should be ready for you know early in the season and i hear dutchy's working like an absolute animal to try and get back as quickly as he can no surprise there for reese dutch who uh of score of course scored the the game winning overtime goal in, in game two won you guys the cup and and was a huge addition to your lineup let's talk a, a little bit more of, of the bad stuff before we get to the good stuff here mouse and and you had a couple of big free agents uh, that were unrestricted, and one, Dane Doby, who re-upped with you guys, but the other one did not, and that's Riley Lowen, who decided to sign in Vancouver. What kind of loss is he going to be, and, and how do you replace that? Well, you know, we're going we're gonna to give uh, Martell a, a shot here. He, uh, you know, there was a, there's an opportunity for the practice roster guys that, that can uh, they can walk at the end of the season, or they can take the the protected practice roster spot. And I think Marty's, you know, he's bought, bought his time and consistently put up 40 goals in the junior A lacrosse league. And, you know, we said, Hey, if there's an opportunity for you in Calgary, we're going to give it to you. And we'd like to, we'd like to keep you around. And he opted to stay with us through that protected practice player um, contract. So we want to kind of pay him back. Is he Riley low? And absolutely not. Um, but, you know, does he have a bright future in the NLL? We, we seem to think so. Um, he played under Do- Dobes in the summer and, you know, Dobes, he grew even more on Dobes, not that he wasn't in the, at the start, but, you know, we're going to give Marty a look and to lose Riley, like the things he does don't show up on the stat sheet. Yeah, the yeah. only thing I could say, and, and I know you guys want it straight. I just hope they use him right. Um, I know how Riley ticks as a person. I know how Riley ticks as a player. Um, he's very comfortable with myself and, and the group of guys around him. I hope that they use him right for, for Vancouver's sake and for Riley's sake because he did so many little things for us and uh, that were real that was real good and, and like I said didn't show up on the sheet but definitely was resulted in, in us scoring 
so many goals per game. And, you know, we made a point of pointing those out and uh, Riley appreciated that. And we really appreciated Riley. And again, um, contracts speak for themselves. I won't talk about the contracts. We're unable to re him up. Did we want him back? Absolutely. Uh, did he make the right decision for his family? Absolutely. Are we supporting 100%? No question there. So he's going to be missed, but, uh, you know, to answer both sides of the, the, the question is, yeah, we're going to, we're going to look to give Marty, uh, Ryan Martell an opportunity. One nice thing, though, going into the season is, you know, last year you really had a helter-skelter offense. The first couple months almost of the season, you didn't know when Curtis Dixon was coming in. You didn't know when Westberg was coming in. For now, it looks like almost everybody signed up. You know what you're going to have day one. It must be a bit of a relief this go-around. Yeah, somewhat. We're going to have some challenges with some travel stuff with, with one of the guys. So there's a little bit of an issue there that – doesn't give us that pure consistency that you're referring to. Um, we'd love to have that, um, but the, the one thing we do lean on is the guys have played together before for you know down the stretch in the playoffs when it was tough and when there was guys in and out of the lineup. And so we got some guys on the back end that we could fill in, and we got some couple of young guys that we drafted to fill those spots. So will we have more familiarity with each other uh, this go around than we did at this point last season? Yeah, absolutely, we will, and uh, we're hoping to build on that and. You know, touched on it earlier about Dutch. He's a huge part, and uh, I think the biggest thing is is uh, him and Dex really, really got to to learn to play real well together. Right now, now at the end of the year, they were kind of first unfamiliar with each other because I, I think I touched on it on one of the shows. They just hadn't played together ever, and that's very rare. A lot of times, the Western guys would get on a team somewhere, but they just hadn't played together anywhere. So that that took us a bit. So, so that the familiarity with those guys and then add a bad pace into our right side you know, definitely helps. And then we'll have a little bit of growing pains on the other side of the floor. But, yeah, we'll have Jesse for pretty much the whole season and hopefully stays healthy. And he was a huge part for us, uh, you know, getting him as a, a kind of a, a trade that never needed to happen. So that was big. So, you know, we're uh, we're hoping to, uh, to, you know, jump right back in where we left off. But, you know, it changes from year to year. We all know that. Speaking with the head coach of the Calgary Roughnecks, Kurt Miloski, and, and you lose Shane Simpson, you give up some picks to get Simpson back, and, and you add a couple of more picks with, with Hayden Dixon and Liam LeClaire. Uh, another year for Simpson is surely going to help his game, kind of rounding in, finding his role and, and where he belongs in that Roughneck lineup. Talk to me about Liam LeClaire and, and Hayden Dixon and what these guys are going to bring to the table and why you decided to draft those two. Well, LeClaire, like, He's he's a guy, you know, left-handed defenseman, athletic, and we're thinking, you know, down the road he can fill into Danny's role and, you know, play some play some good minutes for us as a young guy. We had his brother, um, we have great family, great character from his brother Kellen, and from what we were told, that it doesn't fall too far from the tree with his with his brother. So, you know, that was a big part for us. We like big, long, athletic guys that are physical. Um, we we tend to you seen Callie's last year in Salama, so. That was that was huge for us, and you know, just touching on Simmer, you know, which was Simmer Bell Courier and Mitchy Wild getting up and down the floor. That that you know puts offenses on their toes a little bit, and you know when and where they got to shoot the ball from. So, and then Hayden Dixon, it was a uh, you know I I had watched him play throughout the Minto Cup. I knew of him. I I personally believe he's the best player in his age group of British Columbia, and he did some things as a young guy that's very uncanny. He gets to the middle of the floor. And he drags guys to the net. I know that he's only junior age and he's dragging kids to the net, but uh, he's got man strength. And when he gets to the middle of the floor, he finishes. He's yeah, guys. Yeah. He, you know, he, he just doesn't just take the one shot to the far side. He pumps them. If the goalie just double chicken wings them, then he drops it at the half. And he takes that extra second. He's a pure goal scorer. And, you know, there'd be no pressure on him coming in, but we knew that we would not get him in the second round. And the, the thought process was, you know, we're going to get him now. We'll take our guy. And then when you go look through the second and third rounds, there was no one better at that pick in our mind from an offensive perspective. You know, I know Colorado had their eyes on him. I know that for sure. And there were some other teams that were, were thinking there were, he was going to slide later. I know Rochester was talking about taking him. Uh, sorry, New York was talking about taking him fairly early as well. So we had some intel going into the draft. And, you know, at the end of the day, when you look three, four years down the road, you don't, it doesn't really matter where you took him. If he's going to be, a, you know, a perennial all-star, not to say that that's what he's going to be, but, you know, a 30-goal scorer potential, then it really doesn't matter where you take him. So that's what we were projecting him to be a big-time goal scorer down the road, so we needed to make sure we got him in our stable. And there's an opportunity with Dutchie out and, and Pacer in and out here and there and, you know, to get him in. And, you know, then we wanted to go with Marshall King. You know, I watched him all summer. Did I like his game? Not really. I'd be the first one that I'm going to tell him when I see him at camp. 
Uh, but does he have NL, NLL athleticism? Yes. Is he got size? Yes. Does he do the little things getting on and off the floor well? Yes. To take nothing away from his past previous coaching that he's had, because um, I don't know exactly what happens inside those four walls, but we do think we can coach him up. And I had a long conversation with Jesse about him and how much he cares about the game, if it's important to him. And we got those answers that we thought were important coming back to us. And so we're going to give him an opportunity. Be him and Hayden will have to battle for a spot there. And then we'll see who catches on. So it'll be, be a, you know, offense by committee in that right side for a little bit until we smooth some things out. But we're happy with the, with the three guys that we got there in the draft. Zach Courier has just had one of the most insane years in lacrosse. In the last 13 months, six finals, five titles, just reflect on the accomplishment this guy has given, but also he's just played over 60 games in the last year. Is there any concern that there might be too much wear and tear going down the road? Well, I think that's a big thing with us in the Roughnecks, and, and I can talk to our about about our coaching staff. Is we we see we tend to ramp up as the year goes on. You know, <laughs> you know, and six seasons aren't by design, guys. Don't, don't get me wrong there, but we we don't lean on our guys too too early in in the year, and you know, try to squeeze every last drop out of them. And I know it's going to be it's tougher this year with our schedule. We got to make some hay early in it, but. Um, with Kurt, that, I, I want to ask you, sorry to cut you off, but I want to ask you about this because I've, I've kind of wondered, from the start of your NLL coaching career, has your philosophy changed like going into a training camp like that? Like I, I know you kind of came out of the junior ranks and it's a little different, it's a lot different coaching junior players than it is pro players, but I just wonder where the maturation or the progression or the adjustments have come for you as a coach, being established, being a veteran of the league now, and knowing how to approach a full calendar year as a National Lacrosse League coach. Is it is it a lot different than your early years in Calgary, how you ran things through camp to the end of the year, than what you do now? Absolutely. You know, you look at you look at guys around the league. I'm a I'm a huge fan and I have so much respect for for Derek Keenan and I watch his demeanor and, and I envy the way he is on the bench and, and I see his teams, they they might go 0 and two to start the season and it doesn't face him, and then they're there at the end, and they win the championship. And so, you know, watching guys like that is if I've learned a lot from. I've learned a lot from coming to camp and and just and beat testing the guys and doing. And I know disrespect the bats, but doing the Jamie Bally thing, and you know, you end up walking out of camp with with guys with hamstrings and knees and shoulders, and, and there's no value to it. So, you know, we've tried the full big camp numbers, and you know, we're cutting down and bringing guys to camp when they really don't have a chance. We've tried all that kind of stuff early, and early, but, you know, we seem to think that we get a certain amount of, of guys at camp. we got a nice number that we like to bring in. And then, you know, as long as guys are battle for spots and there's, and, you know, you go in with a philosophy that you, you know, I, you'll hear it all the time. Every, every spot's open. That's hogwash in my mind. Personally, you're not going to cut dogs. You're not going to cut dicks, you know, but you're, but what we do is we make sure specifically we have competition for the Pacific areas that we think we need improvement on. And that's how we kind of draft. But then you lay out your, you lay out your preseason, how, you know, to, to try to get your, the biggest thing is to get my mind is that I don't tip of my hand a little bit guys, but this is what it's all about giving back. And is that when you try to get your offense, offense is always the last thing in my mind that comes together. And we want to make sure that we get our offense working with the guys. That's why I think it's so important to have all your offensive guys at camp and making sure that they're, they're going because you know you, you got to be proactive on offense and you got to make sure that you're dictating and you got to know what's going on. So that 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 plays into how we draft and how we set up training camp and and throughout the season. Like I said, I was joking about the 0 and 6 season or the slow starts or or the or the or the, the, the tough the tough doldrums of the of your marches and your Februarys. But we just try to try to stay the course. And you hear us talk about the five minute segments. You hear us talk about getting better each week we really do buy into that and the guys buy into that and then when it's time to step on the guys a little bit you know we do as a coaching staff but that i'm going to give 99 percent of the of the credit to the players because you got that veteran leadership that just knows when they need to elevate it they don't need to you know they're going to play hard every night no one takes shifts off but you know they just know when when there's tipping points in the season and and we really identify tipping points during games during quarters so you know i, I think it's 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 coaching by committee. It's having a great group of guys around you and just everybody buying into the philosophy. So um, that's it in a nutshell, Jake. I don't think there's any team that's ever going to be happy with its schedule, but yours is a little off this year where you have three doubleheader weekends, including one where you play in Calgary and then have to fly to New England, which 
is going to be a trip in itself. And then you, early on in the season, you've got two back-to-back bye weeks. Is there going to be any issues trying to keep that momentum going early in the season when guys are going to be away from one another for so long? Yeah, you know, like looking at the schedule logistically, I, you know, Eddie, Eddie Cohen was laughing at me a couple of weeks ago that the champs get the bad schedule and <laughs> no sense whining about it. And um, is, is there going to be factors of, of the logistics of the travel and the three weeks off and play three and then three more weeks off? Absolutely. Are we going to use it as an excuse? No, we're not. It is what it is. Everybody's got their challenges. I, I don't. I don't necessarily like our schedule, but um, there's a lot of teams that probably don't. And you know, the NLL is trying to grow the game and doing the best they can, and with trying to accommodate for everybody else and try to get the, the fan bases going and try to continue to have great fan bases. So, put my league hat on. It, it is what it is, and we'll battle through it. Um, but uh, you know, no sense. No sense belly aching about it. But we'll. It's not easy. There's the one game where we got to play in San Diego. And the first flight out of there was 6 a.m., so we're not going to get the guys up at 3.30 to try to make it. We're going to take an 11 o'clock. And tip for any fans, we, we might just be getting there for an 8.30 start. So grab the beer at the Dome and enjoy yourself until we get there because the league didn't want to change it. So we're going to take the one that gets us there when we think we need to get there. Fair enough. Uh, head coach of the Calgary Roughnecks, Kurt Malowski, and uh, also a member of the coaching staff of Team Canada who – just won themselves their fifth gold medal, Kurt, and and you mentioned Eddie Como and, and the rest of the coaching staff there, Glenn Clark, Pat Coyle, Mike Hazen. Uh, pretty incredible to have five NLL coaches, head coaches, in the same vicinity with, with Como being the GM. But I, I know I kind of cut you off with, with Zach Curry, and you can touch on him again if you want, but just give me your general synopsis of – the overall experience, Kurt, from from start to finish, working with Team Canada and being on that bench and uh, winning yourself a gold medal. Congratulations, by the way. Thank you so much. I uh, really appreciate it, Jake. Um, you know, to touch on Zach, I just plan on following him around. So you know, if I follow him around, <laughs> we'll be successful. That's my plan with him. Yeah. But uh, you know, it's it's uh, you know what what a great opportunity to to represent your country as a coach. And you know, I got I was very fortunate enough to do that in 2003 as a player, and now an opportunity to do it as a coach and we, what, you talked about the all-star coaching staff that we had and you know I'd be remiss not to talk about Sean Ferris and and uh, you know Teddy Corey accordingly and you know um, Donville like sure it truly is a great family with Team Canada everybody had a hand in it we had great training staff you know it was really really good that way and everybody everyone did their role and, and I said at the end of the tournament I and I really feel this way is that there was no eagles in that group Everybody just wanted to, to, you know, our common goal was to win the world championship. And, and that's what everybody just did their job. And whether it be from the, from, right from the staff out and, you know, we did it. And, and, you know, Eddie talked to us about just be Canadian, you know, whether it was off the floor, on the floor, whether it was at the hotel, whether it was meeting with the kids, whether it was a practice with, with Austria, whatever it was, we just wanted to be Canadian. And, you know, the, it, it just turned out for us, we had a star studded, you know, roster from top to bottom and, you know, the guys played their hearts out. And just to see the emotion and, you know, even though we're up late in the game, just the emotion of these guys just being on the world stage and being able to represent their country and, and to be able to win that world championship was pretty special. And getting to see all the – learning different personalities and getting to know different guys from different teams. And you got to come together real quick. And there, it was it was easy. Guys were easy to talk to down in the lobby of the hotels and before and after games. And I was I feel very fortunate and very humbled to be a part of it. You know, there's one thing that, that Eddie said to us uh, as a coaching staff, and probably a little bit more pressure on Clarkie than, than it was to assistant coaches, but, you know, we we're all there to facilitate him. But, you know, basically, if you don't win, you don't have no chance of coming back. So if you guys want to come back, then you got you got to get it done. And that, that was our... That was our. That was something that we wanted to make sure as a, as a coaching staff that we, we got it done because we'd love to come back four years from now and then do it all over again. So um, what an experience. Uh, I know the other thing I want to say, the LEC did a heck of a job yeah, too. Yeah. Very well run tournament, uh, great coverage from the media, uh, you know, seamless transitions, whether it was down in the tunnels, score sheets, whatever, all the little things that need to go on the meals that they put on at the LEC, you know, Dunwoody did a great job and, and, and same with uh, Winslate. You know, I thought there's so many great volunteers and yourselves with, uh, with just growing the game at you and Stanford Challenger and all the guys that did it, man. Hats off to everyone. I think lacrosse was the winner out of all of it. Well, speaking of hats, Kurt Malowski, uh, I got. I think I, I hope I got one coming to me uh, eventually from you there. I got her up in the cover. All right, love to hear it. Love to hear it. Take hey, Kurt. Uh, thanks for the time. Congratulations again on a NLL championship and a. 
gold medal at the World Championships. Uh, new season right around the corner as you look to defend that with your Calgary Roughnecks. Uh, best of luck. Not too much, though, of course, uh, but best of luck, and we'll talk soon. Thank you very much, guys. Much appreciated. We appreciate you. That was Kurt Malosky of the Calgary Roughnecks. And, and Evan, we say it all the time, Kurt is is absolutely one of our favorite conversations to have here on Lax Class because he's just, he's, he just gives you the good stuff every time. Yeah, and even when you look at the uh, – you know, in the sorry, the interviews in between uh, TV timeouts, mm. where you're not going to get a cliche answer out of him <laughs> saying we need to do this better, this better. It's, yeah, we yeah. suck. <laughs> this is thing, you know, and, and you're just going to get the pure emotion out of him. Absolutely brilliant. Somebody, uh, somebody should like come up and like do like a montage of Kurt Malowski bench interviews and just kind of snap all those together. And I think it'd be priceless, absolutely gold. If somebody, did Mr. That. Austin Owens, you got your task. Ahead there you go. All right, uh, <laughs> quarter three is now done. We need to wrap up the podcast, of course, with news and notes. We're also uh, gonna let you know what what song the the fans picked for for myself to sing, Evan, <laughs> uh, for for your enjoyment. Hey, or, it's not Shania. Don't be too too. Yeah, sad. yeah. I, 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 I checked out <laughs> or the, Dolly Parton. That one I checked brilliant. out the video on on YouTube, but uh, it's it's not gonna be it's not gonna be pretty. It's not gonna be pretty. <laughs> All right, uh, break time here. Fourth quarter is next. You got it right here on the Lacrosse All Stars Podcast Network. This is Lacrosse Classified. Associated Labels and Packaging is in the business of creating first impressions. They'll help you reflect your company values accurately by offering solutions that fit your product needs. With the latest in printing technology and over 35 years of experience, Associated Labels and Packaging is the perfect fit for your company to take your labels and packaging to the next level. Hey, this is Dane Dolly from the Calgary Roughnecks. You're listening to Lacrosse Classified on Lax All-Stars. Growing the game one podcast at a time. Welcome back to Lax Class here on the Lacrosse All-Stars Podcast Network. Jake Elliott, Evan Sheminar with you. And those are good friends at Associated Labels and Packaging where they create first impressions. Find them online at associated-labels.com or their social media at Associated LP, as in labels and packaging, leading the way in environmentally friendly products, the best in the market as far as labels and packages go. Evan, I know you're uh, looking to, to do a little work with the gang there at Associated LP, and no better than Sean Ashworth and the gang, Tosh Nishimura, the boys down there at Associated Labels and Packaging. Yeah, we in Saskatchewan have a big catch-up game to, to get to BC's levels of... Uh compost and recycling and what have you but we understand with our clients this is the wave of the future some of our smaller clients when they're starting out they want to go this road already so as soon as i get back from vegas we're taking a look at it and see what we can do with it there you go take a look see what you can do you can do so as well at associated-labels.com and uh, see if you can improve your company's labels and packaging and help the environment while you're at it. Uh, all right, Evan, before we get into news and notes, you put up the poll on Twitter about a week ago. We got 170 votes total. Uh, you listed four songs down there. Do you, you explain this. 33% of the vote. Rhinestone yeah. Cowboy is the <laughs> winner or the loser. I don't even know how to. I don't even know. I don't know. It's going to be our intro song for a few weeks, I mm. think. Yeah, <laughs> I, we want people to listen, Evan, not turn off or, or have their ears bleed. Like, listen, I, I got to tell you right the now. They're going to want to listen to no, that. I, let me let me let me say that. That. let me let me just say this right now. Okay, so I, I'm not. I don't want to make excuses. But back back when I was a young buck, I used to do a little bouncing. I was a doorman back in the day. This is a bit of a long-winded story, but I want I want the background to be known here before we get into this. One night, I was working at the bar, got in a little bit of a tussle. A second guy jumped in and, and put his hands around my throat while I was engaged with another guy here and squeezed my neck to the point where my vocal cords got paralyzed. So the next night, 
this back when I was playing lacrosse, I had a had a game with the Sandbellies, facing off against the Burnaby Lakers. Rob Williams decided to take a little li- Rob, head co- or assistant coach of uh, Calgary Roughnecks decided to take a few liberties with one of my teammates, and and it was time to dance with Sato. So back to back nights, I get in a in a tussle, and so my where I'm going with this. My vocal cords are slightly paralyzed. So one vocal cord is higher than the other. That's part of the reason I have this sultry, deep voice that you enjoy hearing so much, Evan. But I do not have a high pitched voice Excuses. anymore. I cannot I cannot I cannot do the the Ric Flair, the woo. Yeah, I, I can't do it. So when I go to sing, I have no <laughs> I am an absolutely terrible singer because I ha- I can't hit I don't have the high note. I don't have no pitch. So why is it that all the punishments that wouldn't be so bad to me always end up on me I, anyway? I don't. I, I don't know. Because like, I'm the, just the, trying to. The pick- cowboy gear would not have been the worst thing in the world for no, me. No, and but it was for me. I, I own a karaoke machine with two hundred thousand songs on it at home. So yeah, <laughs> yeah. Okay. Well, I'm trying. I'm. <laughs> <laughs> You're the first person that I know that owns his own karaoke machine. For one, yeah, I'm trying to figure you, out. You have a Filipino wife. That's okay, kind of like that a makes a little more sense. That I would makes... say a third to a half of Filipino okay. homes have a that karaoke makes, machine. That so, makes yeah. a lot more sense. I'm trying to figure out. Like, I'm going to have to like print off the lyrics to this song. I'm going to have to get somebody to fit. Like, am I filming this or just recording it? Like, what am I doing? I don't even know what I'm doing. So you're going to be singing probably the chorus in a little bit more, so about 30 seconds or so. And, yeah, this this video is going up on social media. So I it's a video. Maybe the LEC would it's a video. You. What's that? It's a video is what you're telling. You it's want this video. on video. Yes. Rhinestone Cowboy. Who sings this awful song again now? I don't even know. I saw the YouTube video. It is horrific, Evan. Like, I can't. <laughs> Well, you would have rather done Old Town Road. I, I'll, I'll I would have rather I'll, won. I'll, 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 I'll give you two outs right now. You can do nine to five, or you can do Shania. No, if you want to switch no. it out. No, I'm sticking with. I'm sticking with. I just. I don't know. Like somebody's got to film me. I need to print out the lyrics because I do not know this okay. song. I just. Just punch it into YouTube. Yeah. The original video is on there. Yeah. No, I watched it. I, I watched it, but that, like I, I have to, I I need the lyrics, Evan. Like I have to print out the lyrics to this song so I know what I'm singing. I'm sorry, but I don't have the words to "Rhinestone Cowboy" memorized. I just, I maybe Actually, you do. I think if you you could you could get if you go further into oh, YouTube, I think god. you can even get the karaoke version. Oh my god! Okay. Well, maybe you can help me out with that, and then i got to find somebody that's willing to film yep, this disaster. Yep, found it already. <laughs> okay, so now now I'm down to I need I need somebody to f- film me. Daddy, Daddy will to do sing. that in yeah, a second. She yeah, is she'll, going to she'll kill herself laughing more than happy, More than happy to do that. So <laughs> I, I don't know when I'm going to do this. Hopefully before next week's show is, is the goal. Don't get your hopes up. I will deliver... On my on my promise, but uh, I'm not particularly excited about it. I don't think the listeners should be as well. This is going to be a total train wreck. I'm telling you right now, I cannot sing worth a damn, and I don't know the words to Rhinestone Cowboy. I'm not going to be able to. I, I, I'm going to do my best, but it's not going to. It's going to be bad. I'm just going to say it's going to be really, 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 should, really bad. We should just have you audition for Canadian Idol or something like that. You'd mm. make the first round video, wouldn't you? Yeah, I'd, I'd make like the William Hung blooper reel yeah. is what I would be on. That's what I would be on. Uh, all right, we need to get into news and notes here, Evan, and wrap this thing up. So uh, thanks for everybody that voted, or I hate you for everybody that voted. I don't know which one. Uh, Beer Hunter, one of my favorite days of the year, Evan, coming up October the 19th, the Beer Hunter, 11th Annual Hunter's Cup. And uh, we raise money for a man that actually resides in Saskatchewan, Evan. His name is Chris Lashenko. He's a former teammate of one of the original beer hunters and Steve Hay that went to Bishop's University together. Steve, uh, Chris Lashenko is, is confined to a wheelchair, and this is for his rehab, which is obviously very expensive, and we've been doing this for 11 years now. Last year, we raised over $8,000, and every year, it's gotten bigger and better, and uh, 
This is just one of my favorite years or days of the year, the, the annual Hunter's Cup, 11th annual, coming up October the 19th. Citadel Middle School is where it's going down. It's a full day of lacrosse. It's family-friendly, food, drinks, lacrosse, music, and just a great time will be had by all. So if you can make it out, you're in the lower mainland here, make sure you get out to the Hunter's Cup. you got to get out here. When it, Chris actually made the trip out here last year, Evan, for, for the Hunter's Cup. You need to come out here and uh, check that out one year. I've got a few other places i got to get to, too. You know, especially for Besky, i got to get out, mm. too, and um, a few others. So, yeah, there's a few on the hit list, too, i got to deal with. But, of course, I just was out there not too long ago. Yeah. So it's no, I'm just saying, one of these years, we're going to be doing this for a long, long time. One of these years, you got to make it out. So, uh, so Hunter Cup, October 19th, Citadel Middle School, all day. We'll see you there. Uh, the NLL announcing the first two weeks of the, I think they did this last year as well, Evan. BR Live will be free for the first couple of weeks, so viewers can... See what they're signing up to, what they're getting into. Check out a little National Lacrosse League action and then sign up for BR Live for the rest of the season. So first couple of weeks on BR Live free, which is never a bad thing. No, and I think the question still remains as to what people are purchasing. I think there might be a, a package deal going on this year for the people in the U.S. Canada, I don't think, is any different because the only thing that's available in Canada is the NLL. So right, right. you're purchasing the NLL product. I believe in the U.S. is going to be part of a bigger package where other sports are maybe combined with it. Uh, keeping up with the NLL, they signed a, f- a couple of agreements. The IBLA partnership, the International Box Lacrosse Association. And I don't know a whole lot about the IBLA, Evan, but there's a lot of teams in this semi-pro lacrosse league. And now I think the National Lacrosse League is kind of using it as a bit of a feeder system for players and also to develop referees and maybe to try out some new rules and, and what have you through the IBLA. The main Northman had a perfect season. They won the championship. I believe Stamper was down there calling some games. The one thing I got a bit of an issue here with with the main Northman, Evan, and I think you might know where I'm going with this, is their logo is is like it's Orangeville's logo. It's it's exactly the same. And I if I was a Northman, I'd be really fired up about this. I don't I don't know how they feel about it, but it, it rubs me the wrong way to see it. Yeah, well, especially when you got such a small community that lacrosse is, you know, to have that happen like that, it's it's a little off. Um, Maybe but, they don't know the anything is, about Orangeville. I don't know, but I, like I, I don't know. The key, once again, we've said, said this before, is that in the U.S., they need to develop more box players because as we get more and more teams, we're going to need more and more players. So having development leagues in the U.S. critical to getting this league up to 30 teams, which is what the league's end goal is. Yeah, I think I think it makes sense. I think it's a great partnership to have. And, you know, the more – they just need to get established. And then, then if this is like they, – they span teams almost across the entire country, which I think is, is very cool. So I didn't really know a whole lot about the IBLA. I'm going to start to learn more about it. Uh, cause it looks pretty legit and the national cross league signed an agreement with them. So it's gotta be Ex- exhibition schedules are starting to roll out here. Evan, we've seen the Toronto rock. They're going to play three exhibition games, ninth, November 9th against Colorado, the 16th against Rochester. And then the 23rd against the Saskatchewan rush for the Toronto rock, uh, for the Vancouver warriors. They're going to play two exhibition games. The 16th against San Diego and the 17th against Saskatchewan. So it looks like the Rush will spend a week in Toronto for one of their training camp weekends, and then they're going to come out west and spend a week in the west here uh, out of the field house at the Langley Event Center. Yeah, this is what they traditionally have done because uh, the team is split on both coasts. Now, I'm still waiting for the day that we have, finally have that indoor lacrosse facility in Saskatoon so teams can fly in. <laughs> yeah, get teams coming to Saskatchewan. Yeah, yeah. I don't believe they're doing the full arena like they they've done in the past, the last three years or so for an exhibition game. But um, even if you know there's a 1500 seat facility and four or five teams showed up, great. No doubt. So uh, just kind of look for exhibition schedules to be trickling out coming 
over the next uh, couple of weeks here is training camp not too far off in the distance. Uh, just getting a note here that Calgary will play Colorado on the 16th as well. Not sure where that one's going down. I would think maybe in Langley as well as Colorado and Calgary usually descend upon Langley for training camp as well. Uh, I got to get Chan Emily Goss update, Evan, because uh, we haven't done that for a couple of weeks. And the news from the Emily Goss and the Goss camp is absolutely astonishing. Emily has, has continued to progress here to the point where she is almost to the point where she's not using a wheelchair anymore. She's been granted access to spend weekends at home which is just incredible to think about where she has come from in, I want to say, about 120 days where she was in an induced coma and the worst was expected to now talking. She's being at home. She's trying to get to the point where she's going to be at home for Christmas full time. That's her goal. And if I know the Goss family like I think I do, Emily is going to reach her goal So just keep the positive thoughts and prayers and all the rest of it coming because I think that's been a real source of strength for Emily and the Goss family as a whole. Uh, For her, progress that she has made is just, it's incredible how much strength and perseverance she has had through this, the family included. And it just, she just keeps getting better and better and better. So uh, keep, keep those positive thoughts going. And I just, I'm just amazed at how much, she has how far she has come in such a short amount of time. It's 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 just it's amazing, um, and that's a lot of it. Just the positive thoughts, you know. It's me. I don't I don't know if you buy into that sort of stuff, Evan. If you believe in karma and all that sort of stuff, I do personally. And just the energy that she has gotten from everybody thinking good things for her has really given her the strength to to have this rehab that she's had. No, I mean, I've seen it, of course, back home with the the survivors of the Broncos and the the positive right. energy that have come out of yeah. them and, you know, how far some of them have come, even the fact that they're paralyzed, but they're still having these positive outcomes come out of this tragedy. No doubt, man. No doubt. Uh, I think that's all I got. I uh, just want to give a quick shout out to Junior. We actually tried to get Grant on the podcast this week. He's obviously a busy man. Didn't get back to me, but... Uh, to John Grant Jr., who put up another virtuoso imp- performance in the MLL playoffs again, putting up five, getting his outlaws into the final. Came up a goal short in the final, but uh, at 44, John Grant Jr., still a legend, getting it done in the MLL, and was just a treat to watch. Um, that was just absolutely phenomenal. You know, the behind-the-back toss where, you know, the guy's totally sold that he's, he's crease-diving, you know, John has not had knees for what the last 10, 12 years, mm. right? Like he's got, how the heck he's still got this much mobility and this amount of ability to dodge guys in close and throw these crazy behind the back passes and goals. And, but at 44, like, yeah, it, and they it's, just go like that's mind-boggling. That's junior. That's junior though. Pretty incredible stuff. Uh, you got anything else Evan, before we get, get out of here? No, I mean, I guess the the key is, as we looked at the opening, we had mentioned we didn't know if Tyler Pace was going to be available in the U.S., and I believe we've got to confirm that the answer is no, he will not Yeah, be. it kind of sounded like that's what Kurt was alluding to when we talked to him, so uh, we'll just have to kind of keep an eye on that situation as well. We'll be back next week with episode number 49. Uh, who comes up next on the list? Colorado for one. Is it Georgia? You've got the list. <laughs> yeah, no, let me, I'm, I'm scanning. As it's not very – yeah, it is Georgia. Colorado and Georgia will be up next. Hope you enjoyed this, this episode. Thanks to Steve Dietrich and Kurt Molusky for coming on the program. Thanks to our sponsors in Pure Vital Labs, Associated Labels and Packaging, and Stampede Tack and Western Wear. Of course, you, the loyal listener, for checking out Lax Class every single week. Don't forget to follow us along on social media. I am at PXP for Sports. Evan is at Shem Lax. And the show is at Lax Class. Also, subscribe to the podcast. Wherever you listen to your podcast, you will find Lacrosse Classified via the Lax All-Stars Podcast Network. Hit that subscribe button, and it gets delivered straight to your phone every single week. Episode 49 is next. Episode number 48 is now complete. For Evan Sheminar, I've been Jake Elliott. And for the fastest game on two feet, and for the creator, 
We'll talk to you next time here on Lacrosse Classified on the Lax All-Stars Podcast Network.